Welcome to the Musician's Toolbox. I'm Andrew. And I'm Angela. And on this podcast, we search for the tools to be successful musicians. Each Friday, we release a new episode featuring guests who are in and also not in the music industry. We talk about a plethora of topics, which thus far have included mindful practice, uh, stress and anxiety, how to have better performances, composing, music production, and lots of other uh, topics. And age doesn't matter um, whether you are just starting out or whether you are uh, studying at university or enjoying music and as an enthusiast, we believe that these tools can be successful or will help you be successful for anyone. And before we get started onto the interview, um, we want to cater content to you. So if you have any requests, for future topics or possible guest suggestions, please contact us um, either through our social media platforms, email, and you can also send us a voice message and there will be a link in the description down below. And today we are talking to Sochi and Angela, will you introduce our guest? Yes, today we have Sochi Tafoya with us um, and I actually have a very personal relationship with, with Sochi, um, I guess in the past, but she was one of my first real bosses, I guess, as an adult. <laughs> um, but we've brought her on here today and some, some reasons why you should listen to what she has to say. Um, she has a bachelor's of music from Scripps College in Claremont, California, a master's in ethnomusicology that she received from University of Maryland. Um, she also has an advanced teaching artist certificate from the Lincoln Center in New York City and a graduate She's a graduate of the Systema Fellowship Program, which was offered through the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. Um, she also has certifications for teaching in public school. So she has the California K-12 through single subject in music, and she also is certified with ORF um, instruments. And currently, she is a music educator working in the Twin Rivers Unified School District. She also has a private violin studio, and when she's not teaching, um, she's an arts education consultant for nonprofits, institutions, and cultural organizations. So, thank you for being here today, wow. Sochi. We really appreciate you making the time for us. Thank you so much, um, both of you, for inviting me to join in on your conversation and you know share ideas and ask questions and be curious. Awesome. We're excited to talk to you. We, yeah, I'm excited to, to be here. Yeah, for we sure. Like, we like to start off with our uh, our guests to kind of see if there were any pivotal moments in your life that kind of led you into your career in music, um, whether they were a mentor or an experience that you had, um, and just kind of what's, you know, led you to, I know your career has changed quite a bit, <laughs> like from, mm -hmm. from graduating college to where you are now, and so... Right can you like give us a couple mentors or pivotal moments or just kind of how you are, where you are today now? Yeah. Great question. Great way to start our conversation today. Um, I think one, um, pivotal moment, um, if I can think of like an archway that kind of like sews all of my experiences together is, um, growing up in my, um, hometown, I, I was super active, um, family value, um, parents paid for private lessons for violin. And in addition to that, I um, was very involved in a um, Chicana Latinx um, cultural center that still exists in my hometown. Um, and so I always had this duality of going to rehearsal, playing classical music, performing for my teachers, doing the whole Suzuki, you know, methods and, you know, music camps as a youth, um, youth symphony, all that stuff. Um, and then that, that happened there. And then I would compartmentalize and then I'd go to um, my, uh, the, the Latino center um, called the Casa de Raza at my hometown every day and do folkloric dancing, <laughs> um, which were regional dances all throughout the States of Mexico. Um, and so I did that, that was my like, boys and girls club. That was my programming, right? Um, and I learned how really valuable skills from both of these like cultural organizations, institutions. Um, and I learned quickly how to code switch and it, what do you say and 
how do you act in those different, what languages you speak in those different sort of spaces. And not um, just English, Spanish, but also <laughs> the underlying language, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Like not, you know, like exactly all the above, right? Um, and so um, I, I, that's how I survived. Um, and that's how I also flourished. Um, and I think that that's like a really pivotal moment for me because I always wondered why are these things separated? Mm-hmm. And the community that I felt dancing folklorico dances regionally from Mexico involved the whole family, involved food, involved music, involved dance, right? And there was a sense of community and togetherness that I didn't feel playing classical music with the music. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, why does this have to exist? And at that time, I'm significantly older, there was a either or, less than, greater than. Oh, you're Mexican American, Chicana, you don't know how to read music. Mm-hmm. You must really play mariachi music. And then on the flip side, right? Oh, you're a classical musician. Do you know how to play mariachi? <laughs> so I always, you know, and yeah. this was in the like late, you know, early, late 80s, early 90s, completely different cultural mm-hmm. shift then that we do have now. Um, and so I think that duality and that duality of it was like, why? Um, I, I can be, I can do both. I don't, it doesn't have to be an either or situation. And, you know, mariachi music is such a great tradition um, even though I didn't at that time when I was playing violin, didn't play mariachi, I, I just danced the folkloric dances. Um, I knew all of the music because I, I knew all the steps, right, um, that attached to those music. Um, and so, you know, it was always this like battle of identities of like, I'm not, I, I don't fit in or mm-hmm. at both of those spaces. And so I think that that's been the overarching like thread that I've had in my career in terms of music and being advocating for equity and access in the arts um, is really trying to bridge that community and create musical experiences um, that are really bridging the two together. And they're not just bridging a certain community that into that tradition, but porous enough that others feel included and united and invited and engaged to participate. I really relate to what you're saying, um, feeling like there's two different worlds Mm -hmm. uh, from a very different standpoint, but, you know, growing up on a farm and raising cows and that feeling like such a very, very strong part of me. And then going to that classical world of music and like just blown away at how different those two spaces are. So, yeah, I I, I hear you. I, maybe maybe that's why we both learned to code switch so well. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. And, and, and I don't know what other word we can use in terms of code switching, but, you know, um, but it's just like, why why is there separation? And then why is there, you know, I don't know if you felt like this for Angela, but for me, it was just like in the classical world, classical world even though I had, you know, a great teacher and I had access and I had a, an instrument and, I had weekly lessons, like I had all those opportunities felt to me, but in that classical musical world, at that time, it wasn't, I was always not enough. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Because my parents weren't musicians because they weren't, you know, professional musicians or I didn't have the teacher uh, in my area. I wasn't enough, right? And so it was just like, wow, like really? We're all here because we love playing music. Right. And we all everybody gets like, something out of it. Why? Why? I'm not first chair. OK, but I'm still here. I'm still part of the group. Right. Um, yeah. And so I don't know where that competitiveness or that not enoughness or, um, you know, I don't I don't know where that comes from. I don't know if that's like just a capitalist issue, you know. Um, but I, I've been more interested in my career to create opportunities where, OK, everybody everybody can be included. And, you know, if you, if you're first chair, great, awesome. You're going to teach the person as much as you can and help that net, your stand partner know the 10 notes that you've mastered. Right. Um, and so I, I think I'm always curious to make it more porous and more inclusive and how can you have really magical moments where they're really human, you know? And I think, um, 
I think one of the first times um, I really felt the power of music um, was uh, in my 20s. No, well, actually, as a child dancing folklorico, I would see this with the mariachi and we'd go to performances. And of course, with mariachi music, everybody knows all the songs. It's like karaoke, right? Mm -hmm. They know the lyrics. So you have a very, like, very educated listener. They can tell right away whether it's going to be a good mariachi or a bad mariachi. Like, <laughs> an orchestra situation, you know, not everybody knows, you know, maybe half, three fourths of the, the audience in the orchestra knows the canon or the repertoire that's going to be performed that day. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of pieces that they may have heard only the first time or the second time, depending on how innovative those orchestras are. Um, but, um, uh, and I remember like we, this, this great mariachi played and I was dancing um, and then the mariachi played and uh, the audience requested a song for the mariachi, totally typical, like standard. And they asked for this song. It happened to be uh, the song that he knew and he, he came up and he sang with the, the, the mariachi. And then he cried because it was because he, it was a song for his mom that he just recently passed, mm -hmm. right? And so at that point, I remember thinking like, whoa, here's this mariachi having this impact on this guy who's 50 years old, who just came up, got to perform with the first professional musicians, and then also had a moment of healing. That's spectacular. Mm -hmm. That's that's it. That's mm -hmm. that's the Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's the human moment. Um, I want more of that. I want to create more of those things. How can we create that? Because I think that has more impact than selling out. I mean, the, selling out your, your concert and ticket sales and follows are great and give you, give you a lot of things. But I'm, I guess I've, I've always been interested in that human moment. Um, and I think that's, that's why I went into ethnomusicology to study music as culture in different cultures. And that's why um, you and I, Angela, met and worked together, you know, creating um, a Sistema inspired program in the Central Coast. Um, and all of our programming there was always intentional of like, how do we share what we're creating to a greater circle of people? So it's not just me and my, you know, 20 years, 30 years of playing this mm -hmm. piece of wood. Um, so could, this is the internal. So could you explain to us what El Sistema is? Mm -hmm. Andrew actually asked me this mm -hmm. before we had this interview. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. he's, he's dying to know. Yes. Because dying a lot of people know. don't know what El Sistema <laughs> is. So El Sistema is a, um, El Sistema, it comes from, um, the El Sistema movement comes from Venezuela. It is about a 40, 47 year old um, method of free music education sponsored by the Venezuelan government. Um, and it was started by um, the late uh, Jose Antonio Abreu, who was a brilliant musician, organist, conductor, um, and um, economic uh, economist and politician. And he started this whole movement of music education and music making named El Sistema the System um, because he really wanted to um, provide so you, social development for youth. And at that time, 40 years ago, there wasn't, um, you know, uh, there wasn't any pro programming for kids to learn, um, to learn music. The public music system doesn't have music in its system in the educational day. Um, and so he really wanted and it really believed to create social change. We really need to activate and empower uh, and create joy and create excellence with our youth. What better way to do that than start an orchestra? This is specifically in Venezuela. <laughs> okay. Right, so this was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. People thought he was nuts. People thought you're crazy. Um, and so he was very savvy, very intelligent and um, really strategic. And he started his youth orchestra with 11 kids and they rehearsed in the garage because there was no space for them to rehearse. 
And the following year, they went to a competition for youth uh, orchestras and blew everybody away. And in that year, they grow from 11 to like 50, right? Mm -hmm. This idea of like, if I know how to play 10 notes, then I can teach the, the next person eight notes or nine mm -hmm. notes or why not all 10, right? Mm -hmm. So this idea of group uh, instruction, this idea of everybody in the orchestra is equally as important and there's a space for everybody to learn. So if you would create um, uh, differentiated scores, so an advanced score and a beginning score, but they would still play in the same piece, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you have multi-level musicians playing in the same orchestra. Mm. Um, and so that kind of just like multiplied. And he would take these 11 students and they would go and travel to different parts, different towns in Venezuela, and the students would teach students there and so forth and so forth and so forth. And now I don't have the stats with me, but now in Venezuela, um, I think there's like Gosh, I don't want to correct. I, there's like a million people that have like a, a very strong classical wow. education background. Mm -hmm. And he was so savvy that um, after they won recognitions and stuff like that, um, he had convinced um, uh, the government that this should go, this program should be go, go under the, the, the cabinet of the president of Venezuela. So all the oil money went into, you know, went for the services of Venezuela, but part of it went into El Sistema Funda Musical, which is, that's what it's called in Venezuela, um, to, to provide instruments to this, to all these nucleos or schools of music. And in Venezuela, which is incredible, if you show up to these music schools, your neighborhood music school, nucleo, um, you get a free instrument and you can come and learn how to play your instrument. Um, and if you commit to it, till like 12th grade, then you get to go to college for free. Wow. So after 40 years, what it looks like is like there are thousands of these nucleos in Venezuela and throughout Latin America and this kind of spread all throughout Latin America, um, Colombia, uh, Argentina, Brazil, um, Ecuador, all throughout Venezuela, Mexico, all throughout the Spanish speaking Americas and um, and uh, here you have, you know, second, third generation of uh, Venezuelans who are super fluent in their instrument. And we're, I'm not talking about like, you know, 12th grade school orchestra. I'm talking about like Mahler's third. Mm -hmm. And like they, they memorized it, they performed it, wow. they toured with it. Um, and then they can play like great salsa music and mm -hmm. mariachi music mm -hmm. and jazz music. And they are professional psychologists and firefighters. And, you know, they're picking up their kids and they're picking up their cousins at the music school. And they're like, oh, give me your trombone. Let me play something, mm -hmm. right? But it's a super porous, like everybody's a musician's musician sort of mm -hmm. culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they perform anywhere and all the time. And the idea of like, you know, El Sistema, one of the, the philosophies is that it's excellence um, and it's also rigorous. So um, in Venezuela, um, uh, you know, the school day ends about one o'clock. And so these programs are open from one until 10. And so you have um, these Venezuelans, which are incredible, incredible musicians out of this world. And they're practicing at a very young age, you know, they're putting in six, seven hours on their instrument at the community school. And it's absolutely free. And everybody's there knowing their friends, that like, and their, <laughs> friends, their cousins, you know, their auntie is in charge of snack and the cafe. So, you know, like if you're out of line or, you know, like if you're giving lip service, oh, your auntie's there. She's going to tell you to get back in the, you know, <laughs> wait, mm -hmm. what is this? We don't have time for this. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's the whole the whole village is involved in your music education learning. And part of that is like, it's creating social change and it's developing you know, executive functioning skills in your brain. But um, through, the, through the, the orchestra and through learning your instrument, you develop a sense of self, which you and I know, 
um, and uh, you you develop um, you develop uh, you know skills that 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 will help you successfully become you know a global citizen, a citizen artist, um, and really you know help give back to your community. Um, and so it's this movement's been again around for 40, 50 years in the in Venezuela and the, the Spanish speaking Americas. Um, and about 10, 15 years, 10 years, 10, 15 years ago, I don't have the exact dates in a minute. Um, the fam most famous musician that we know here in the United States is Gustavo Dudamel mm -hmm. came out of this system and he's a conductor of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and in his appointment in, at the LA Phil, he started a system inspired program called Los Angeles Yola Youth Orchestra Los Angeles and a whole bunch of other programs sprouted up throughout the United States. Um, and currently I think there's probably about 150 organizations, um, system inspired programs spread throughout the United States um, and Canada um, and um, serving about 20,000 students that are, are participating in a free or reduced price or pay what you can music edu community music education program um, that really um, uses classical music, uses folk music, uses um, different sort of performance traditions to really create um, uh, excellence and joy and community and um, perseverance and ultimately create leadership within the youth. Um, and it was a great, Angela and I know each other through working at a Sistema inspired Cal uh, program in, in Central Cal California. A couple other things about El Sistema is that it does create excellence, but also accessibility, but not just in the, the students have access to, like access to instruments and ability to play, but for audiences as well, which is something that is really dying mm -hmm. in classical music, in my opinion, yeah. um, because you have to dress up in your formal dress right. and go to the fancy concert hall and be there 20 minutes early. And if you cough, you're going right. to be glared at by 20 people. Don't you dare a cough drop. <laughs> and here, like you said, they're picking up their kids and they pick up the trumpet and they do, you yeah. know, and, mm -hmm. and the concerts are in the middle of the street or they're mm -hmm. at the community center. And and right. the orchestra that, that started touring to represent the country of Venezuela, which you probably know the name of, which I don't, but they don't perform in tuxedos and black dresses. Mm -hmm. They wear track jackets mm -hmm. and suits. <laughs> Yeah, on a they national were, stage. They were young kids back mm -hmm. in the day, um, and you can—I mean, there's a whole for your viewers, for your listeners. There's a whole like you can LC Sema, you put that into YouTube. Gustavo Dudamel, LC Sema, and there's a whole bunch of great videos to give you information about this. Um, I think what it's important to um, for our conversation is to understand, you know, um, as musicians, what. There, there are really great gems in the El Sistema movement um, that I think, you know, as Angela talked about, that we can really take in our own music making and our own music performance and our own studios and really activate um, those values in whatever we do, whether that's our string quartet or our gigging as a wedding musician or an orchestra musician or in our private studio, how can you really take down that fourth wall? And by fourth wall, I mean like, the wall between the audience and the performer, right? Mm -hmm. should be that that wall. Um, how can we take it down so it could be again a more community and communal and accessible and a porous relationship? Um, because I think that's where the that's where people will continue to do it, mm -hmm. right? Um, people will continue to pay for your shows and buy your CDs if there's a human relationship. Um, people will will buy season tickets if there's that relationship that's really personalized and really drawn in. Um, especially now when you have, you know, performance groups, we 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 can't gather to hear music. Um, mm -hmm. So um, we're, this might be a, pop, a perfect time to really innovate what it means to go to the orchestra. And I know, you know, a lot of orchestras are 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 
battling with this, like really struggling. What do we do? Right. And uh, so many of our, my friends, your friends don't have their orchestra gigs anymore, um, which is heartbreaking um, Mm -hmm. during this time during COVID. So um, there are a lot of great gems that I think that I carry with me in my own values, in my teaching, in my um, alliance with El Sistema values and the movement and also um, my my values in um, in how I conduct and how I approach uh, classroom teaching in a group um, at the public school level. Mm-hmm. So can you speak to um, some of the kind of negative uh, stereotypes, I guess, that happen in classical music, whether it's um, when we compare ourselves in a negative or toxic way to one another or um, you know, that doubting oneself or even just the difficulty of being in a practice room by yourself all day. Uh, mm-hmm. Some people like that, I guess, but I do think that it takes its toll no matter how much of an introvert you are. Um, so how, how did a program like El Sistema make those things? Was it less? Did it not exist? How, it, how was it different? Um, did people compare themselves? Was there like this awful uh, competitive, competition between like stand partners or how, how did you see a difference? And that cutthroat, cutthroat yeah. mentality. Yeah. Um, I, I think in my experience with um, programs here in the U S um, and what I saw, it was, it was completely in topsy turvy like that. I, I feel from my understanding, it, it didn't really exist. Now I think that system of programs and, you know, the Simone Boulevards, which you referenced, the youth orchestra that toured um, in jerseys when they're in high school. Now they are decked out in tails and black tie and look very posh in their performances. Um, now, but um, it was it was all about the team, you know, like we we have to sound we're working together and we're we're we're, we're creating as a group something bigger than ourselves in that orchestra. And so I think if like the, and I don't know if that's because uh, it started in a, in a Latin country, in, mm-hmm. in a Spanish speaking country, which there's a sense of togetherness and family, family values are, are very important. Um, that, that had that sort of um, texture to it. Um, but it, it, it was, there's always a place for someone and it, you could be in the advanced group, you can be in the beginner group. There could be one orchestra with multi levels of instrumentalists in that group. Um, but I think it's more of like the communal, of like, oh, we did it together. Um, and in the programs that I've seen here in the US, it's always of like, oh, you know, you got selected to go play for Judamel in LA during the summer program like we won as a whole community music school or as a whole new deal, you know? And I think that's just a, a different, um, a different mindset really that is really um, activated and embodied and um, celebrated by the, the program directors and the teaching artists that are hired in these programs to really embody and model. Um, and that team, kind of like a team camaraderie uh, or sport, sportsmanship um, in having it. Um, and, you know, when you're at a music school for five hours a day, learning a piece of music, like you get to know your your orchestra, your viola section is your family. Those, those are your ride or die. You're rolling in 10 deep of violas. That's awesome. Um, you know, not many people want to play viola, which is, <laughs> out. but you know, like it, you're not the only one of two violists in your youth symphony, right? You're one yeah. of 15 and, you know, maybe you have rotating stands where everybody gets a chance to be the first player, the first chair. And the conductor gives great honor to the person who's leading from behind, because that's a great skill to have as the last violist in that section. That's not a hard position to fill. It's not easy. Mm-hmm. So um, I just think it's uh, it's a mindset. And I don't, you know, I, I, I was thinking this morning and last night after we talked to Angela, I'm like, why, why is there a cutthroatness mm-hmm. in classic? And where did that originate? And 
why is it bred constantly with teacher and teacher and youth orchestra after youth orchestra? Um, you know, this idea of like, I'm not, I'm not enough, right? Or, you know, if you want to say imposter syndrome, or mm -hmm. why, why do we have that in our culture here in the US? Um, and like, you know, there's people who go to Juilliard and go to, you know, Curtis and go to NEC, and that is fantastic. And that's outstanding. And they are in love with their instrument and like, yes, support them as much as possible. Um, because there are there are musicians, musicians, right? Um, but the, there's there's also space for for other people to coexist in that sphere. I think another thing that goes along with that that we were talking with, I don't know if you know Kimberly Dre, but she's a violinist, and she, we were talking about how, you know, in the classical music world, you only know one class people like outside of the musical realm only know one classical musician. And that's Yo-Yo Ma, and You're right. and it's and it's kind of I mean talk it's kind of killing the the genres that that uh, posh the the uh, I don't know what how to, how you would describe it but just that uh, that unique culture that classical music usually has that cut cutthroat culture. Mm -hmm. Well, or it's not accessible, right? Yeah, like, yeah. It's only accessible to a certain. Mm -hmm. people that live in New York in, City as and it's income bracket and yeah, yeah like it's, there's a <laughs> geographical edu like educational mm -hmm. class issue that goes with you know the bourgeoisie yeah. you know orchestra um and I think to save orchestras they really need to and I, and a lot of them are and kudos mm -hmm. um are really examining like how do we in innovate ourselves mm -hmm. um, because what happens when all the baby boomers Mm -hmm. Honestly, um, die. Mm -hmm. What? Who's gonna fill up those seats? Um, and that affects, you know, our friends, our cousins, our partners, who are professional musicians, um, in their their jobs and employment. You know, mm -hmm. um, universities and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, LC Stemma inspired programs are all about kind of deconstructing that and mm -hmm. kind of like really really allowing not only excellence and equity in um, uh, in learning these instruments, both non-classical and, and classical music traditions, um, but also creating partnerships so that the students that come into these programs have are set up for success to feed into other pathways in their communities, whether that's their local youth symphony or the university or you know, summer programs. Um, so it's really changing the face of what, the face and sound of classical music here, I think in the United States and really exciting to see, you know, the first generation of um, students that are now 18, 19, you know, mm -hmm. getting full rides to Peabody mm -hmm. and full rides to Curtis and um, working at great cultural institutions like, you know, Juilliard or, you know, life and really, really um, becoming the, the next generation of what classical music can do and um, the impact that classical music and other music traditions can can um, become more, more normal and more accessible rather than a kind of elitist form. Mm -hmm. I think that really, that really, you know, it really turns people off. Mm -hmm. For sure. Not only in classical yeah. music, but any, you know, any sort of <laughs> subset, you know, elitist, yeah. you know, it's too stuffy. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't wear a suit and tie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't take yourself we're, like, so seriously. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You uh, know, we're in our soft pants wearing hoodies. Like, awesome. Mm -hmm. Like, this is, mm -hmm. here's my dog. I'll do that. Welcome I'll do to that my living on, room. Uh, I'll do that on my <laughs> next piano recital. I'll just go out on my, uh. <laughs> My sweats, from, uh, my COVID yeah. sweats, and my uh, right. <laughs> and you could have, but you know, I mean, there's yeah. there's something. You know, I have a, a small studio here in Sacramento, and you know, one of the things that I did, which um, we did, um, Angela and I did in our Sistema inspired program, was we introduced our pieces, right? But I had each of my students who are you know from five to eighteen in this recital go up there and say, "Hi, I'm Emma. I really like you know um, surfing." 
And I'm playing, you know, the accolade violin concerto. My favorite part of this piece is this little part. Let me play it for you. Um, I've been working on this for six months. I hope you like it. And mm, let's play cool. it for you. Right. And so like I have students actually like practice that in in the recital hall, which is adjacent to my studio. And like we did that, like it took them like three or four goes to like practice yeah. this right but then the parents were like that was amazing like i didn't know anything <sighs> about accolade violin concerto and i didn't know that instrument violinists could play two be two notes in at one go called the double mm -hmm. you know like something so simple yeah right, that you and i take for granted mm -hmm. right? um but like that really changed that environment of a recital where it wasn't so like they were dressed nice. They weren't wearing, you know, literally their soft pants, but like, <laughs> you know, um, you know the, it, we made it fun and we made it engaging. And I think more, you know, more musicians are doing this. Um, more musicians are incorporating and, and really creating again, that human connection and something so simple, like adding, having your students add safe five sentences before they play, mm -hmm. you know, a piece not only is that like helping them with their leadership and public speaking, but it's also bringing in the audience into that music making experience, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, oh, let me play you that little two measure phrase of double stops. Mm -hmm. While I play it, I implore you, I invite you to listen to that little nugget and see if you can find it, see if you can hear it, right? Mm -hmm. So then it, it really engages the audience as a listener to really deeply listen rather than to sit in the... <laughs> Yeah. And, and the audience would be like, okay, what, what's the recital? Okay. It's this <laughs> check. Okay, not Got one now. done. Check. check. <laughs> yeah. Or like, oh, you know, my son's, you know, 15th out of 20th. Oh God. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show up 10 minutes late. Right. Or, right, right. or early. I can, go, yeah, leave, I can early. leave early or we have soccer, soccer game, mm -hmm. you know, like all that stuff. So um, it makes that recital more meaningful because, mm -hmm. you know, guys know as both musicians it takes a lot to perform it's, it's, yeah you know, it's, that the 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 the, the, fa the non-musical family members or the friends may not understand how many hours and time it took to really learn that piece at that level mm -hmm. well and plus they're not there for the cla the classical music really they're kind of just there right. because you're doing it yeah right but like why like is that okay? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. Like, is that our goal? No. No. Like, yeah. Again, it, it reminds me back to like my, you know, twelve-year-old self, where I saw a fifty-year-old macho Mexican man cry for the first time. Mm -hmm. I never saw that because he lamented over this song, um, that you know, amor interno that he 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 dedicated to his dying mom. You know, so like that's 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 more interesting. Yeah. Right. That's I want to see that because mm -hmm. I, I saw that as a twelve-year-old person, um, with my upbringing, my culture, and where I came from. You know, so um, I'm more interested. I think there's something there. That's the gold. That's, mm -hmm. that's the gold that you want, at least yeah. as a music educator and a musician, and mm -hmm. what I my values. Um, and, and how I teach is to really create those opportunities. And it, it does take work and it does take time. Like, as I said, in my example of um, my, my high school student to prepare high school students to say five sentences before you speak, like we, we practiced that. Yeah. Um, they were nervous and we figured out, you know, what, what do you really like about this piece? And they're like, I have no idea. I've never <laughs> thought about that i'm okay. supposed to like this piece i'm just playing what? it because you don't <laughs> it to me right you know and, and like even that like why what you know um you know growing up in the suzuki method like all the whole repertoire is already laid out right yeah. like yeah. teacher didn't assign it it's already there's book one book two book <laughs> and a practice and stuff like that and i you know i coming from the suzuki method and and i i lean heavily on the suzuki method i understand the process but I also think there's an opportunity as a musician and teaching musician, like give your students voice, like listen to them, what they want to hear and what they want to um, play and what excites them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Cause I think that's at, at equally valuable, if not more than mm -hmm. 
whatever sequence is designated designated in uh, whatever pedagogy books that you're using, you know, mm -hmm. um, and really implore your students to like, you know, you're, you're playing classical. Well, sign up for that jazz class. Mm -hmm. if, you know, even if you play the violin, go for that jazz, go for the jazz band. Like, why not? You know, mm -hmm. um, that's only gonna, gonna help you um, and, and try different musics. And mm -hmm. you know, the more, the more you can do, I think, it will help you in the long run and help you figure out what you want to do, whether that's become a musician or mm -hmm. become a doctor. Or... Yeah. Awesome. So I like to ask our interviewees um, what they consider to be their greatest accomplishment in life, which I know is mm. like a huge switch. Uh, <laughs> but I just find that uh, for me, it's, it's centering to, and refreshing to hear when people have accomplished so much like what they really come back to is considering like that this is what I've really achieved in life this is what really matters to me so could you tell us what you consider yeah. to be your greatest accomplishment um I think um I think one of the greatest accomplishments that I have and it directly reacts to you Angela is when we really worked hard to set out our own West Side Nucleo uh, Music School. And I think that was a really lovely, beautiful space and place that we created for those families. And I think hearing and reconnecting for this podcast, I think hearing that some of those students are still playing music is just like a, a gem, um, a golden nugget to, to feel like, okay, these, these are, um, families and students that, you know, for whatever reason, didn't have access and under-resourced uh, areas and communities and are really prospering and um, finding great joy in music. And it's not all of them, um, but to hear that, I think that's that's really nice. That's like, okay, we did, we did really good work um, and that's something to be really proud of. Um, so that's, that's one of my, one of the things that I think is, is I, I, yeah, I'm proud of that work that we did. Um, it's gratifying to have a dream and actually see it realized, I think. Yeah. yeah. And it's still like, it's living on in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. It's living on through the family structure, through um, the ecosystem of that area, um, you know, are supporting those specific families. And I think that's, that's really awesome. Um, I think the other thing um, I'm one of the things that um, I'm I'm proud of, you know, not necessarily the um, I'm not I don't necessarily have great. Well, let me rephrase this. Uh, there's not events that were like most impactful. I think in answering your question, I think. Like greatest achievements are those relationships that have been longstanding mm. that I've cultivated as a 16 year old, as a 12 year old, as uh, a 20 something, a 30 something that are still with me to this day that I can lean on, that I can phone and call them. I can zoom with them. Um, I think those having those longstanding relationships are, 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 are gold with, colleagues with friends with mentors um i think those are those have been kind of like very very sacred to me in a sense because they've they've helped me grow and expand and they've they've challenged me um to become better and constantly like evolving and reflecting hmm. awesome thank you and you know i think as a musician like it's the music world's so small mm -hmm. right even if you're in Idaho, even if you're in Central Coast, even if you're in, you know, Alaska, it is a small music world. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's, it's a blessing. And, you know, if like, you know, I don't, you know, I don't see Angela for another five years. I know that I probably will see her again, you know, <laughs> yeah. it is small, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe at the compound, maybe someplace out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So to summarize, what are some tools that musicians can put in their toolbox? Um, 
I think as a, a young musician, um, I think as a beginning musician, I think as a experienced professional musician, one of the tools I think would be great. Um, and I, I really, you know, call the action, your listeners and your followers is really um, allow your students and your musical choices and your musical performances to really engage in the audience and the listener and really innovate and challenge and um, challenge yourself to create those opportunities where you have those human moments. Um, and I think that that's gonna be needed um, going forward because we've been isolated, um, but that's gonna be the golden ticket um, to really have a uh, performative career and um, more opportunities to perform. And I think that, that those things are, um, uh, I think those are, are really important going forward because I think not only is music a way to bring community together, but music is healing itself. Mm -hmm. And so the more ways that we can cultivate that, the more we can use music, um, not only as an entertaining way, but as a catharsis and a healing way in our society from all the loss that we've had um, currently, you know, um, in the state of California right now, last what, 14 days, um, 4,000 people have died, which is just horrific. Um, so you think of, I think of 4,000, 4,000 families and mm -hmm. aunts and uncles that have lost people. And, um, I think that going forward, um, you know, as, as a toolbox, get your rubber band of flexibility, <laughs> and really use that and really in your ecosystem, in your state, in your city, how can you be, uh, create musical performances um, and share your love and skill and um, desire to make music? How can you make this more porous for more people um, and accessible to more people? And, you know, uh, to have them really actually deeply listen um, and maybe they'll shed some more tears and mm -hmm. have some, some healing and lovely moments. Um, and I, I just think we need more of that. Um, uh, that would uh, be, that would be my, that would be my, my, my tool. Get your, make sure you have your rubber band of flexibility yeah. in your toolbox. Um, and really think, use that rubber band in your teaching in, in the, the, the piece selection that you use, um, you know, play classical music, um, music of different performance traditions, music of, of composers of color, um, to really expand the, um, the soundscape of the audience. You know, how many, I mean, I know it was just recently Beethoven's birthday, but how many times do we need to hear Ode to Joy? You know, like, you know, or play <laughs> Ode to Joy and have it in different languages. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. what has to be English and German all the time. Right. You know, like there's little things that you can do as a musician, as a conductor, as a um, performer to, to change it and to be more reflective of the community that you live in um, so that they can they can understand that. Um, do it in ASL. Right. Because um, there's so many people that aren't they're not getting it. And I think it, as as citizen artists and musicians, um, it's your role to, like, break it down. Mm -hmm. and share that and then what, a, what what's a, a, yeah and what a perfect time now like going yeah. getting out of i mean hopefully eventually getting out of the pandemic and being able to perform again what a perfect time to reset that um, right that that mental thought of of the eliteness of the classical music realm i mean right or just right. sharing right. music yourself it doesn't have to be yeah just and sharing music like this is this is why i play this and don't get me wrong like i love beethoven yeah. but like i think we could do more you know yeah. it's 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 not it's not a but it's the yes and yeah. right mm -hmm. like why not perform it in you know um you know why not have 
you know, your string quartet on a, I don't know, a big, you know, tow truck and have it being a movable, <laughs> movable tow truck from different points in your neighborhood and you're uh -huh. playing, you know, an original composition by, you know, the, the 16 year old um, in your youth symphony group, yeah. you know, like, create these opportunities they don't have to be um because you want a competition there's yeah. so many ways that we can create these really magical moments and share our, our music making and our music process that i you know now's the time and if and as a young musician starting off your career like now's the time to you know set up success and you know get yourself you know branded with your hoodie and all the socials and really start producing and sharing your process. I think that's been one of the cool things, you know, looking back, you asked me, like, how do you um, relieve stress? Like, I'll go and work, like, search on various, like, YouTube and Instagram, different performances. And it's been cool to see performances virtually <laughs> and how different musicians are, like, dealing with that and presenting themselves through an Instagram live or a YouTube live. Um, and that's kind of cool. Like mm -hmm. and that we can, can, we can still do and have face to face as well. Right. You know, yeah. um, I don't have to live in New York city mm -hmm. to see these awesome musicians that live there. I can stream them from my hometown mm -hmm. or where I currently live. But that's, that's accessible. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, we just need to do that. So I, I don't know. I think hopefully that answered your question as yeah. far as, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank so you so much for, um, for, for, uh, for inviting me in and sharing my perspective. What a great interview. Thank you so much for listening and watching. And we truly hope that you have found some tools to put in your toolbox. Our podcast, as a reminder, can be found on various platforms as well as on YouTube. Once again, feel free to send us a DM or voice message with anything that you'd like to see in the future. Um, we often post announcements and upcoming guests on our social media, so if that's interesting to you, you should go and give us a follow. Yeah, we would love some follows. And lastly, while we do love doing this for free, podcasting is not free. So if you really like what we're doing and have uh, gained some value from our show, there are a few ways that you can support us. You could share with your friends. You could rate and review. And subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You could also shop our merch, uh, which you might have seen in our YouTube videos, or become a supporter through a donation at the Anchor Podcast link in the show notes below. Thanks for watching. See you later.